Hello, this is W6EL, and today I want to show you an interesting radio from the SGC company. It was made in the mid-90s. The model number is SG2000. And as the brochure says, this is a sideband transceiver for HF. It covers 1.6 all the way up to 30 megahertz. Output power is an easy 150 watts from four MRF 455 transistors, capable of significantly more, so it's, it's nicely derated. The radio is generally sold with a separated faceplate with this 16-pin cable. That's right here. And it can be mounted either on the front of the radio or in another location, as many as 100 feet away without a problem. The designers used balanced audio and balanced data cables. We'll go into that in just a minute. Let me show you how to use this radio from the perspective of a ham radio operator instead of the other users who would use channels in general. So here we are tuned on 40 meters. If you want to change frequencies, it's the same number of buttons as it is on the ICOM 7610. So you press this button, then you press frequency. Now we're in program frequency mode and we just type in whatever we want, say 28.4 for example. And then press program again. It's that easy, now we're on 10 meters. To tune, we press frequency, and we use the up-down buttons. Very simple. You can hold the button down to tune rapidly. And you can set the tuning step, which I think is a, a nice feature. Some marine radios don't have this. So you hit shift. Oops. When it beeps twice, it means the button kind of bounced. So I need to clean the pads. Shift, step. There we go. And we can choose the tuning step down to 100 hertz. To get out of this, you can just wait or you can press volume and then press frequency again. And then you can use it. You'll notice some sounds, little clicking sounds when I tune. Listen to this. You hear that little pitter pat? That sound has something to do with the way the radio changes frequencies, and it's present even in their more advanced model, which has the uh, PowerTalk DSP head unit. It's just something about the way they designed this radio. You'll notice that little beep it just made. Now we've lost frequency control. So I had to press frequency again to get back to it. This radio has a lot of annoying things like that with it. I think it's tolerable. We'll see in the long run how it does. Other features you might want to use as a ham radio operator. Here's how you change modes. Upper sideband, lower sideband. There it goes. Again, I had to time out of what mode it was in in order to do this. But you can see the indicator over here. To get to AM, you press mode. There we are. Now we're in AM. It's a true AM receiver with an AM detector. The transmit uses upper sideband and a uh, rather strong carrier, and that's enough to be received by most AM receivers. Other features we got here, uh, there's the voice and telex filter button. You can switch between the voice and telex filters. Or there's a jumper on the inside of the board you can move, and then you can use this button to switch between two AGC settings, which is how I have it set right now. You can't hear anything different at this moment, but uh, sometimes you can. Other features, we have the uh, 20 dB attenuator. There's high and low power. That switches between uh, about 50 watts and 150. You can actually set what they are in the inside of the radio. So you could do like 100 and 150 if you wanted to, I'm pretty sure. There's the clarifier button. This radio has a stabilized oscillator and chances are you will probably not need to press this. There is metering for forward power and SWR. Mine doesn't work. We're going to fix that later. There's also a clock and you can switch it over to date if you want to. There's numerous channel scanning and scanning bank functions. I haven't really bothered with that stuff because that's not how I intend to use this radio. I really just want to type in a frequency and go. Now let me show you some of the problems I have with this radio. For one, this speaker is definitely burned out. Let me show you. Volume up. It has this really crusty sound to it.
And I believe that's just from, you know, 30 years of exposure to the elements. I hooked up an external speaker right to the back of these terminals and it sounded fine. So I hope I can just replace the, the speaker in here. Another issue I have with this radio is the built-in speech processor. It has one, it's a little board, it was an option, and it's terrible. It will actually lower your output power below your peaks to the point where you actually get more average output power without it. It's like a very, very aggressive compressor and it's not actually helping anybody. So I'll be replacing that with another board like I did on the other marine radios I worked on. You may wanna check some of my videos. Another thing, this stock microphone is terrible. I mean, it's probably the same thing they sold with CB radios at Kmart. It's awful. It's a dynamic mic. It sounds dumpy, like you've got a sock over it. And it, it just really sounds bad. So I'm gonna rewire this plug to accept a standard ICOM eight pin microphone with an Electrek condenser, like most radios use today. And together with the compressor board I'm gonna put in, I think this will have really good transmit audio. Another issue I have with this radio is the squelch. Marine radios typically have a squelch on the sideband. That way it can be left on and it doesn't bother anybody until a station comes through. However, this squelch here is really not good. It's an audio level squelch only. It doesn't detect syllables even though it claims to, it can't. And because of that, it just doesn't work very well, especially with a noisy signal. Let me demonstrate that for you. By the way, the squelch is done inside the head unit. So if you hook up an external speaker like I have for this video to the telex output, you won't hear the effects of the squelch. So here we go. I'm gonna turn the squelch. That's good, right? Well, now we can't hear anyone. So we need to adjust the squelch level. All right, shift. Oh, there he goes. So that's how it is supposed to work. This meter here, you may think it's a signal level meter, it isn't. This is a rectified version of the receive audio. That's all it is. So for example, if you go to AM mode, it will not show you the strength of the AM carrier, it will only show you how loud the person is talking on the transmitter. It's not a real S meter, just a VU meter for the audio. One of the problems I have with my radio, besides the fact that the speaker is blown out, is the relays used in the low pass filter of the RF amplifier. They've really lost their conductivity. Some of them have as much as 500 ohms resistance across the contacts. That's no good, it can't work. And the worst part of it is the receiver goes through the same set of relays. That's right, unlike most HF receivers that have a dedicated receiver bandpass filter, this radio doesn't. It uses the low pass filter from the transmitter. That has two consequences. One, of course, is an, a problem with those relays affects your receiver too. That's a given. The other one is that there is not a high pass filter on the RF. So for example, if you're in the 20 meter band, the low pass filter will cut off everything above, say 18 megahertz or something. I forget what the cutoff is. But everything below that, all the way down to, and including the AM broadcast band, is passed through. And that creates some sensitivity issues, especially when there's strong signals around you that are using lower frequencies in your current band. That's probably why there's a high pass filter board included inside the radio. That high pass filter board is designed to reject the AM broadcast band. But really, I don't think that is enough because there can be strong short wave stations on other bands as well. So that may be something I look into modifying after I fix it up and align it. Let's take a look at the rear of the exciter unit. You've got standard SO239, chassis ground, which is also right here, they're the same. You've got plus and minus for the 12 volts. These are on screw terminals, which you're gonna to wanna to put on some kind of connector like I have. It's a lot of current. Figure 30 amps or more on transmit. RS-232, there is a documented protocol in the owner's manual. It's kind of complicated and there are not a lot of programs that support it. There's a switch here, you can't see the labeling. This switch turns on the oven for the crystal reference. That way it's always aligned instead of um, just when you turn the radio on after a few minutes. The downside here is you're always using some current. So if you don't have a very robust power system, you wanna leave that off. For home use, of course, leave it on. These are the remote plugs. They're for the head units. 
The two head units supported with these plugs are exactly in parallel. There's nothing fancy going on between here and here. What tells them apart to the controller inside the radio is the address programmed at the factory into the EEPROM of each head unit. You can't change it, which is a shame. Little jumper switches or something would have been nice. So anyway, there is two wires for audio. They are used in balanced formation and they can be used for transmit or receive audio or intercom audio. Yep, you can intercom between multiple units on here. That's kind of cool, they threw that in. It's also got balanced data, which is in the form of RS-422 or 485, low data rate. And because the audio and the data are balanced and shielded separately, you can get away with quite a lot of um, cable between the units. That's pretty nice, also helps with the EMI. This is the Telex input and output. Basically for digital modes, it's a fixed gain audio output, audio input, ground and push to talk. You can also monitor for push to talk on here. I found it floats around five volts and when the radio transmits, it drops down to zero. So that could be very nice for doing digital modes with a computer. There's also the coupler connector. This is for the automatic antenna tuner. I actually got one of those as well with this. Here is the brochure. I haven't used it yet, but I will soon. And that's uh, ground, 12 volts, and tuned, which is where the antenna tuner tells the radio it has tuned. And there's an indicator for that on the front panel of the display. This is a vent here, and there is not a fan in this radio, which I think, given that it can dissipate 150 watts, a fan really does make sense. And interesting enough, the circuitry in the radio supports a fan. There's already a temperature sensor and a logic circuit to toggle a fan pin when it reaches some threshold. So I'll probably add a fan here. I don't see a reason not to and just have it turn on whenever it gets hot. That's pretty simple. If you look on Google Images, you'll find that some of these radios have a panel that covers this area for wiring. I think that's really cool. Um, but it seems like most units don't have it or the owner has lost it. This little compartment right here if you look in the corner, let me zoom in a bit. Yeah, right there. That is so that this cable for the remote head can turn around and go to the front where you can mount the head on the front of the radio. The front of the radio is just a big brass panel. Not a whole lot to look at there. It's probably not brass. It's like uh, anodized or something. I don't know. Allodyne. Something like that. Um, in my case, though, I'm using it for these two wires. These wires are necessary because of my low pass filter problem. So this is way I, this way I can connect an antenna to the radio and bypass the low pass filter board, which isn't working right now. Okay, that's about it. Stay tuned, look for the next video where I fix up the transmitter on my unit, do the alignment, fix the low pass filter board and make some corrections to the audio circuit so that it sounds good and works with modern microphones. Thank you very much for listening.